welcome back to Uncensored. Now, in case you've been in a cupboard all day or haven't gone on social media, let me tell you that the coffee chain Cost of Coffee has caused a furor following an advert they sort of put on the side of a van, basically featuring a cartoon of what appears to be a post-operative transsexual man. Now, critics who've been very angry about this online all day say it's glorifying and celebrating irreversible surgical procedures for young women. A spokesperson for those behind this mural from Costa said, quote, at Costa Coffee, we celebrate the diversity of our customers, team members and partners. We want everyone that interacts with us to experience the inclusive environment that we create to encourage people to feel welcome, free and unashamedly proud to be themselves. The mural in its entirety showcases and celebrates inclusivity. Now, we're going to be talking about this now. Is it outrageous woke propaganda or just a storm in a coffee cup? Who better to then to give us our opinions on this than CEO of the LGB Alliance, Kate Barker, and celebrated LGBTQI plus campaigner, Peter Tatchell. Thank you both for making time uh, to talk about this. And I'll Thank just, you. Uh, if you don't mind, give you my uh, view on it. And I sort of included it within the opening sort of uh, talk in the show regards nuclear. So, you know, we've, got, we've taken our off the ball here. We need some perspective on this. The furor over issues like this drives me absolutely up the wall. Um, I understand there's important sensitive debates and discussions to be had about the trans movement and about its place in society. Uh, but I am slightly exasperated by the attention that this type of stunt gets. And I'm, my concern is that corporates and companies are now exploiting the experience of trans people, saying that they're being inclusive, but at the same time knowing that it's just going to generate so much controversy and conversation around their brand that they won't be forgotten about. And sure, some people may boycott Costa Coffee, not get their coffee, but some people may well go in, and that's successful marketing in and of itself. My fear about all these things, as always, is that um, trans people haven't been included or consulted within this debate. Um, I'm obviously far on probably the more left and wokey end of this than some other people on this network as well. Uh, but I want to come to you and ask for your opinion on this. Um, let's just start with you, Kate. I mean... Well, I mean, to start with, I think it's actually... It's ghoulish and it's grotesque. And, and it's really greedy of Costa. Imagine thinking, what's really going to make our tills ring? Mm. I know, the, the mutilation and the misery of girls who hate their bodies. And this isn't about a trans issue. This is about girls who are opting for bilateral mastectomies. They're having healthy breast tissue removed. And it's not a niche issue. It's not a small issue. I, before I came on this afternoon, I hopped on to um, GoFundMe. And I, into the search bar, I put top surgery. And there are 8,649 girls saving up, hoping, planning for top surgery. GoFundMe is only one platform. There are loads and loads of others. So what we're looking at, really, is tens and thousands of girls in the UK trying to save up money to get this done. Now, it, so it's not niche. It, I, I don't think it... I, I like your storm hmm. in a coffee cup, but I, I, don't, I don't think it is. And I think it's about vulnerable girls, I don't think it's a trans issue, and I think that adds, that adds too much um, heat to the mm. debate. I think it's very much more about girls who are gender non-conforming, and I would say that a lot of those girls are tomboys, what used to be called tomboys. Mm. Like, like me, when I was a kid, I didn't like, I didn't like uh, dresses and pink, and I wanted to play football. Um, and I, if I was 12 now, and I saw all this, and I saw the glorification. If I was being cheered on to go ahead and, and to mutilate myself, I would have just mm, leapt onto it's... that bandwagon with with um, with both feet. I see the point you're making. Uh, mutilate to me is a strong word mm. when it's obviously we're talking about people who are young doing this. Yeah. We don't know the person on the cost of could be 26, <laughs> but the the core of the debate is of course that young people in the in this sort of uh, industrial complex of breast removal and augmentation yeah. and everything else like that are being exploited, Peter. But if it's voluntary, is it mutilation? I mean, this is strong terminology. Well, first let me say that I think that the obsession with the trans issue is out of all proportion. We have more than 7 million people on our hospital waiting lists. Some of them are dying because they can't get surgery. And we're obsessing over a cartoon on a coffee van. That's absurd priorities. But to answer your point directly, in this country, no one can have gender reassignment surgery before the age of 17 as a minimum in England. Oh, sorry, that's, I, I, that's let, me, let me, let me, I didn't interrupt that's, you. That's let, false, let me, Peter. let me finish. Let me, you didn't interrupt. 
in England, not before the age of 17, except if there are exceptional circumstances. But most people will wait three to five years to get their first appointment at a gender identity clinic. They will have to have a series of further appointments, usually between six months and one year apart. And then they have to wait another three to five years to have the surgery. So it's very rare for anybody to have surgery before the mid to late 20s. And I know people in their early 30s who are still waiting, having applied 13 years ago. OK, so you're saying the issue isn't as uh, grossly out of proportion or uh, it's not happening as frequently as some might think and some people are struggling at this. Kate, you had a point. Yeah, it, it, it's actually false that uh, no children are being operated on. Uh, the NHS has highlighted 51, it's not very many, but 51 girls aged 16 and 17 who've had mastectomies. And I, I know you think mutilation is, is a bit extreme, mm. but, you know, those, that's healthy breast tissue. That, those operations are really, really serious. And there's a reason why, why people like Peter call it top surgery. Because I never they, mentioned top because surgery. Because I've heard you mention it before, because it's... it's Oh, it sanitises it. It sounds quite cute and neat and easy and simple, but it isn't. It's a really serious surgery. Ask any woman that's had breast mm. cancer what it's like to have, have a mastectomy. And to do that to yourself, to health, your healthy body, it's irreversible. I think it's the only silver lining is that people do have to wait a long time. Is there an age at which you would deem it acceptable for somebody to make that decision themselves? Our position is that for a very small minority of people who've had the proper support, proper counselling, had time to think, having a surgery, a cosmetic surgery, which enables them to resemble the opposite sex is a good option for them, and we hope that would help them to live a happy life. And we'll... I don't think it's down to ages, except we would say never, ever, ever for children. It's absolutely wrong. Let's listen uh, to some testimony now. In fact, this is the story of Chloe Cole. She's a detransitioner, 27th of July, 2023, her 19th birthday, testified to Congress with a final warning that medical treatments to change the gender of confused children is, quote, horrific. Uh, let's take a listen. We need to stop telling children that puberty is an option. Puberty is a rite of passage to adulthood, not a disease to be mitigated. My childhood was ruined along with thousands of detransitioners that I know through our networks. Enough children have already been victimized by this barbaric pseudoscience. Please let me be your final warning. Ow. Peter, interesting points already brought up by both of you this evening in that separating this almost from the trans discussion because you've got other things going on here. You've got people, as Kate said, who prefer to look like a tomboy. Uh, you've also got the issue of age and consent going on here. When you hear Chloe's testimony, uh, how do you think that plays into the way the public are perceiving all this? Well, I'm very sorry for Chloe that mm. she went through a bad experience, but she did not go to that experience, uh, as far as I'm aware, under pressure or in a short space of time, this resulted in many years of counselling and seeing specialists, and then she decided to go ahead with it. Now, I'm sorry that she regrets it. I'm very sorry for her. But there are only less than 1% of trans people who have gender reassignment surgery reject, uh, reject or uh, have regrets about it. You know, 99%, or almost 99%, say it has dramatically improved the quality of their lives they're happier, more fulfilled individuals, and their families and friends support that. So for most people, Chloe's experience is not typical. Gender reassignment surgery is life enhancing, and it does mean a better quality of life for the people who go through it. So I would say live and let live. Oh, OK, so uh, statistically, Peter's saying uh, exception to the rule. I, I mean, that's, abs that's simply false. We don't have any data. Uh, for the for the huge influx of young people who've been having those kind of surgeries in the past few years, we have no long term data, and that that's just plucked out of the air. That ninety nine percent, you know, that's that, that's a very suspicious. There's figure, three I major think. three major surveys. No, hang on, hang on. So so what we do have, we have no evidence that children, particularly girls, are any happier after their surgery. We have a lot of evidence, for example that most children who are allowed to go through adolescence unmedicalized, 80 to 90% grow out of their feelings of dysphoria. So we would always argue that waiting is best. We see, we see what's happened with this poor girl, Chloe. I think that in years to come, we're not going to remember the names of these girls because there's going to be a flood of them.
And do you think that they've been caught up in a zeitgeist, Peter? I mean, returning back to the original uh, source of this conversation, Costa Coffee, can you believe it? But the way that the narrative has been pursued by corporates, by companies, but also by society, do you think people are getting caught up in it? Teenagers, young people influenced by social media? There may be a tiny element of that, but it's not typical and not the norm. Mm. The vast majority of people, and I, I know dozens and dozens of trans women, I wish Kate would stop calling them girls. They're not girls, they're mature women, often in their well, 20s, Chloe 30s was and 15. 40s. Chloe is 15. We yeah, just, yes, just, and I just, yeah. I just explained that I had sympathy with her, but she's in the United States, she's not here. Here in this country, people have to wait years, typically for re gender reassignment surgery, from the very first application to have a, a gender identity clinic appointment, it will take 10 or more years for them to have any surgery, during which time they are counselled and given support so they've got opportunity to reconsider and to assess whether they're making the right decision. So the idea this is rushed or forced on people is simply false. And it's really painful for those many trans people who have to wait all these years to get the surgery that will affirm who they truly are and make them happy. I just say that those eight and a half thousand young people, most, mostly girls, who are crowdfunding for their surgery aren't going through the NHS. I was, I was busy on Google today and I had a look at clinics in London where you can go and get gender reassignment surgery and the prices for it. Mm. And they are absolutely booming. So the NHS is one thing and there is a long wait time, but people are, are funding for surgery themselves and they're going to clinics which are taking advantage of people who dislike their own bodies. It's an absolute scandal. Well, we, this we would agree, be the biggest scandal. We agree. We agree that no one should be rushed into this. Yeah. Yeah, and that no one should make a swift decision. Yeah. It has to be thought through very carefully. People have to be counselled. They have to be questioned. And they have to be given other options. And then if they decide that's what they want, then we should respect their autonomy and their right to consent. Yeah. I think that is an agreement we've reached. Mm. And look, uh, I don't think we've finished talking about it. I think this will continue to be a hot topic of debate extraordinarily. But this evening, we've learned, of course, that there's so many different levels of this and people involved. Uh, Kate, Peter, thank you very much for your views.